Good morning, my name is Jasmine. Welcome to ECCI Online. We are glad that you are joining with us this morning. I'm going to start with a few announcements. So as we mentioned last week, our website is still down unfortunately, but we are in the process of um, fixing it. So if you usually book your tickets, here is an alternative way to do that. So as you can see in the description box, um, there will be a link to Eventbrite and that will be the way that you can book your tickets. During this season, if you would like to give in a prayer request or a praise card, there will be a number below that you can WhatsApp and would be happy to share on Sunday. Registration is now open to the Mission Worship 2021 Summer Conference on Saturday the 21st of August. It's free and there's a packed lineup of gifted worship leaders to encourage, inspire and equip you throughout the day. So please book in now at www.missionworship.com. Now that's all of our announcements done and now we're going to have a time of sung worship with our worship team. Enjoy. Good morning church. As we sing this song, let us be reminded that God is our saviour. He is our healer. He is our deliverer and that every praise we give him always belongs to him. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our With one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. It's true, I'm 
Hi church, I'm Chloe and I'll be doing today's Bible reading and prayer. I'm reading from Matthew 6, verse 33 to 34. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And Father God, I just pray, Lord, for um, everyone who is struggling to put their faith, myself included, in you to seek you first. You know, where there's so much uncertainty in, in the world that we live in today and there's so many things going on. Lord, it's easy to put our faith in things in the world that seem concrete and things in the world that may portray to be a, a good place to put or seek first. But God, I just pray Lord, that today um, that we both make the decision as a church and um, to seek you first, God, and that we will see, Lord, that you will provide all things, that we will see that we can actually delight in you. And God, show us, show us all the times that you have provided for us in the past and remind us of all the times that we have sought you and you have provided and we have sought you and you have met our needs like 10 times more than we expected you to and and because we can trust you and because we can seek you first it means that we don't need to worry so I pray, Lord, that you help us as a church to put our trust and faith in you, put all of our hopes and dreams and desires because your plans are for a hope and a future uh, and, and not for dis disaster and despair. So help us to trust you. Help us to trust that, you know, tomorrow is in your hands and the next day is in your hand. Next month is in your hand. Next year is in your hands, Lord. Our whole entire life is your is in your hands lord our, our children are in your hands lord our, our parents are in your hands lord our education our works our jobs our finances everything is in your hands and all we need to do is seek you first and you'll take care of everything else so lord i pray lord that as a church that we make a decision today to not seek after the things of the world or seek after things that seem concrete but god trust you and seek you and we'll what and 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 we'll delight in seeing you provide for us miraculously and we'll delight in seeing that you know we no longer need to worry about tomorrow we know we, we no longer need to worry about things that we probably have the right to worry about but god we don't because we trust in you and we have faith in you and because we're so focused on seeking you and and you we're so focused on being righteous and serving you that that you in turn provide for us and you in turn meet our needs and show us that there really is nothing that you haven't already taken care of. So God, I thank you that you are in control of all things. I thank God that you are the God of the universe and that you created us and you know every single burden that we have. And I pray Lord today that we give it to you and we seek you instead and we watch you provide and meet every need for us. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure you've been well greeted by our host today. I'm Pastor Anthony. If you're tuning in for the first time to join us as Emmanuel Community Church International today, can I recommend you start at the beginning of a series? So last week, Tracy Campbell spoke brilliantly on Uncover to Recover, a communion um, exhortation. And that's part of a theme where we're looking at factors that we may be facing as we return to church after lockdown. So today I'm going to be talking to you about fear, specifically stepping over your fears. Next week I'll be back on my birthday, no less, to talk to you about what it means to find resilience in my 60s. So you can recognize these are common themes that we're trying to address. Then for the rest of the month, Pastor Doug will be with you and we'll be discussing the key mental health issue of depression, and then the importance of connecting, connecting with people. So for our thoughts today, if you've got your Bible with you, we're in the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to give you a little bit of background to him, because Jeremiah is someone I relate to very easily. He had an incredible call on his life, 
but he dips and he digs into some very personal issues. We, we know almost more about Jeremiah's inner life than we do about what he did. And one of the themes he explores is fear. He was a young man when he received his call and as he moved into ministry, his fear of people was an obvious issue, his own fear. And it's almost as though the underlying story of the book of Jeremiah shows us how God enables him to step over. I think fear isn't something we can go in denial about. We all have fears. It's not a question of, do you get afraid? It's, what is the object of your fear, really? And so God enables him to step over it. And we learn a lot from Jeremiah's life. More importantly, we learn how to copy that, paste it into our own lives and deal with our own fears. So how are we going to step over our fears? If you're in your Bible, we're in Jeremiah chapter 1. In context, Jeremiah is about 100 years after Isaiah, similar period, slightly later. Isaiah is one of the longest book in the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah is actually the second longest book in the Bible. And there's a lot of biographical information that reveal, reveals his inner workings. He actually sustained a leadership ministry that spanned 46 years. That's a couple of years more than myself. The context of the country is it's in a spiritual mess. It's about to be almost wiped out, almost a genocide situation with the Babylonians. And he lives through all of that. He comes from a religious family, as I do, a family that was respectable but poor. That's how I describe my family. He didn't even live in the city, he lived right outside of Jerusalem in a small village. And as a very young person, he is called by God into what is clearly, even at its birth, a significant call. He was probably in his early 20s, maybe even in his teens, and he was called to speak and embody God's truth uncompromisingly in a very tough contemporaneous situation. For most of those 46 years, he remained poor. He was very isolated. He was hated. He was rejected. He was misunderstood. Some people would say, hey, welcome to Leadership 101. But many people, not just leaders, find themselves as Christians in that context. So his warnings, which were stark and severe, were largely ignored. His life was threatened. He was locked up. He was thrown down a well for a significant amount of time. And if there is a title or a subtext to his life, Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet or man of sorrows. And in that role, he's a little bit like Jesus. Christ was called the man of sorrows, and he's a type of Christ, if you will. To the degree that he had very, very bad days. His mental health probably wasn't always and altogether stable. If you read between the lines, some have suggested there were times when Jeremiah was even suicidal. He certainly got very emotional about God. There were times when he ranted against God. He actually cursed his mother for the day he was born, similar to Job. And as you read through the book, there are countless times when Jeremiah wants to quit. So here's a shout out to all of those who've ever been or right now find themselves in a situation where you're thinking about quitting. Quitting on your relationship, quitting on your local church, quitting on your job, maybe even quitting on life. Well, you're in good company. Jeremiah's a good man, a great man, but human like the rest of us. His life, however, has enormous influence over the nation of Israel. And what's striking is that despite the fact that he gives vent to his fears, he's not in denial about those things, especially in chapter 1 where we're going to be exploring today. He brilliantly breaks through it. And his pathway to breakthrough will probably be very similar to yours. He listens to God. He believes God and allows the tracks in his mind 
and the functions of his heart to respond to the revelation of God rather than his inner fears. So if you've got your Bible, turn to the book of Jeremiah. If you find the middle bit where Psalms are, it's an inch further in. Jeremiah chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to pick out some verses, first of all from verse 4 to 8, then from 17 to 19. Jeremiah is speaking in the first person and he says, The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Now you would have thought a revelation like that would be staggering and Jeremiah would get up, feel 10 feet tall. Instead, Listen to his response in verse 6. O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. Echoes of Moses, I can't speak. Verse 7, the Lord replied, Don't say I'm too young. For you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Immediately God speaks into his fear, understands his situation. He says, don't say I'm too young, but don't read that as a chastisement. God is relating to him. He said, okay, I hear that, I get that, but the call there is on your life means you cannot let this become a handbrake. You cannot let your fears restrict or narrow the broad life that I have planned for you. And he says, don't be afraid of the people, knowing he's afraid of the people. I will be with you and I'll protect you. And as if that isn't enough, God signs off that little part of his speech by saying, for I, the Lord, have spoken. In other words, this is what I say now. I hear what you're saying. This is the truth. That's your perception. This is the truth. I have spoken. And when God speaks... Normally, that's the end of the conversation. He knows. He understands. Okay, come down with me to verse 17, where he starts to mobilize him now. God says, get up and prepare for action. Go out and tell them everything I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. Here's an interesting ploy. The wisdom of God here is staggering. He says to him, look, don't be afraid of them, else I'll make you look foolish. He, what is he doing? He's putting himself in front of Jeremiah's fears, and he's saying something which was an, an incredible life lesson to me, and it's this. If the significant fear in your life is the fear of God, it will supplant the fear of man. If the significant fear in your life is the fear of man, it will supplant the fear of God. I have found personally that in proportion to my fear of God, my fear of man dis dissipates. It's almost as though, God, as though God is saying, you think you need to be afraid of the people? I'm the one you need to fear. I'm the one who controls all. And if you're worried about consequences and recompense, be thinking about me and my holy nature. God goes on to say, See today, I have made you strong, like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole life, the whole land, the kings, officials, priests, and people of Judah. God says from the smallest to the greatest, they will fight you, but they will fail. That's enormously comforting for Jer Jeremiah to hear. But of course, he's warned as well. Yes, they'll fight you. Yes, you'll have enemies, but they'll fail. He signs off similarly, saying, I am with you, and I will take care of you. Jeremiah so needed to hear that for the awful adventures that lie ahead of him. Again, God says, I, the Lord, have spoken. If you have a word from God into your situation that's the bottom line. That's the period. What God says happens. 
So Jeremiah begins by focusing on his fear, and then he listens to the God who drives them out. Fear is not always a bad thing. There are healthy fears that protect us. The fear of God, according to the writer of Proverbs, is the beginning of wisdom. So not all fears are bad. If you check more than two ways before you cross the road because you're a bit nervous, that's a good nervous. It'll probably help you live a little bit longer. But there are unhealthy fears that we live it with, and they restrict us. Sometimes you need permission from your fear to make a decision that you shouldn't really be thinking twice about. If God asked you to do something, he wouldn't ask you to do something he wasn't going to equip you to do. Go ahead and obey God. Walk out on your fears, or according to the title of my sermon today, step over your fears. Because those fears cause you to live in chains. They narrow your movement. They restrict you. You know what it's like if you've seen if someone has a chain on the foot, they start to move the way they want to move, and all of a sudden they can't go any further. That's fear. Fear puts a wall between you and your dreams, between you and the purposes of God, between you and victory and fulfillment. Fears restrict you. And God wants you to live a spacious life. He wants you to live without, he wants you to live with moral borders, but no courage borders, no life borders. Whatever God asks you to do, you can do. And fear does this. And so we make choices in relationships based on unhealthy fears. Ladies frightened that their biological clock is ticking, so they just find a man wearing trousers and kind of shortcut some of the things they need to be thinking about because their agenda is driven by fear. Some get married out of unhealthy fears. Some get divorced out of unhealthy fears. Sometimes we parent our children out of unhealthy fears. We do our jobs or we don't do our jobs or we change our jobs. And the engineer between, behind all of that is not divine wisdom. It's human fear. Even though I fear God, my relationship with God is based on love. I know he loves me. He's good as we sing. You're a good, good father. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's my identity. But unfortunately, every area of our life can be affected and infected by the condition of our heart, especially if it's governed by unhealthy fears. So my prayer today is that God will help you break free, step over those fears, get on a level playing field where you can start a journey of realizing God wants you to do that. He wants you to step into a life that you never imagined would be possible because your fears said, I can't. So let's go back to our text and look at verse 6 there where Jeremiah is telling God he can't speak because he's young. God tells him, who will speak with? It's non-negotiable for God. You can't speak? Here's who you'll speak to. Kings, officials, priests, the whole nation of Judah. Even though Jeremiah is young and inexperienced, God says, I'm going to present you before kings. Jeremiah, remember, lived in a culture where age mattered, where the voices of the young were not heard, where you had to be old to be respected. But God is saying, no, speak out from that. Speak into a culture that probably will not even receive you. But I'm sending you nevertheless. Obedience is success. Results of ministry aren't always a sign of success. God prophesied at times in Scripture, said, look, I'm sending you to people who will not hear you. Be prepared for that. Don't measure your success by how many people are seated and listening to you. Measure it by how closely you can stay to the call I've placed on your life. And in verse 17, God addresses that fear directly. God knows Jeremiah is terrified and this terror has paralyzed him. God says, I command you, don't be terrorized by those fears. God follows up with some very comforting word. He, he says, if you're terrorized by those fears, I'll terrorize you. I can hear my mom saying, I'll give you fear. It's almost as though God is saying, focus on me. 
Let me be where your eyes are. So God gives him this promise to make him strong. And he goes on to say, the people will fight against you. They'll rebel. They won't listen. Even Jeremiah's own family actually plotted against him. God does not disguise those challenges. But God says, as he's saying to you today, I am going to give you something to overcome those fears. We all have obvious external fears, heights, spiders, darkness. I have a mild fear of heights. I have refused throughout my life to let it debilitate me. So what happens is if I'm on a cliff edge or if I'm high up a tree or I'm high up a mountain, here's what happens. It becomes more exhilarating because of my fear. I get to say, I'm not listening to you. I'm afraid, but I'm not going to let that restrict and narrow my view. I climbed Ben Nevis twice. I'm really proud that I did that. The third time I got stopped by a storm and my sister was with me. But if I'm honest, I'm really relieved she wanted to turn back because my heart wanted to also. External fears. But, but for Jeremiah, there's something going on inside him that nobody sees. He has internal fears. Sometimes you see someone behind a microphone or you see someone giving some kind of public address and you think, I bet that person never gets frightened. I bet they're never nervous in front of a camera or a microphone. You would be surprised. The problem is those internal fears are harder to identify. Nobody else sees that. So they're not always coming alongside to assist you because they're unaware of how those internal fears drive us, engineer us, control us, causing us to respond to life in a narrow way, in an increasingly constricted way. And those fears do this. They converge, they get tighter, they get tighter until your fear is your Lord. Make your Lord your Lord and the fears will move in the opposite direction. Some of us, again, have fears of intimate relationships. Some have the opposite fear, the fear of being alone. Some fear getting a lot of attention. Some are afraid of being neglected. Some fear pleasure. Others fear pain. Some fear the loss of love. Others fear being in love. Some fear life. Others fear death. There's a thousand fears that can manage and control us. So again, researchers are noting there are new fears emerging in the comet tale of our pandemic. The fear of here, the fear of making mistakes, living in a world where the rules change twice a day. You don't know if you're in the law or out the law. You don't know if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Massive fears of rejection because there are people now who've lived inside their houses for 18 months and can't remember what it was like to enjoy being outside. That fear controls them. Some people have a fear of relaxing. They think somehow God has made them to work 24-7, to just keep going, 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 until ultimately they burst. And it's worth a while right now, as you're listening to my voice, to ask this question, what are you afraid of? Don't be telling me you're not afraid of anything. That's not true. What is the object? of your fear. Fear of dating someone, if I'm single. Fear of looking for a new job, because the job I have, I hate. Fear of never being able to say no, always saying yes, even though you know you want to say no. What's really behind your inability to just stop and be at rest? So that issue of fear is present in all of our lives, maybe at different levels and certainly different types of fear. But the question we need to ask is, how much is that fear dominating me? Am I controlling it? Is it controlling me? Am I dominating my fear? Is my fear dominating me? How much is it constricting and restricting my life? How many of my decisions are being made by my fear, my relationships, my decision, my future, my financial management. And it, it, it's, it's a piece of string, isn't it? It's great to prepare financially for your future. 
But if you've got 40 insurance policies, you're probably being driven by fear when you could be driven by a more wise savings program. So it's all a matter of degrees. What might happen in your world in the future? What will happen in my life when I retire? What's happening in my family? What's happening to my career? Imagine if you could manage all of those areas of your life without this dragon of fear calling the shots for you. Imagine what your life could be like in all those key areas if it wasn't controlled by fear. Imagine if you could just step over those fears. Imagine what would happen inside you. Imagine what God could do through you. I wonder what would have happened if Jeremiah allowed his fears to fully control him. Firstly, we wouldn't have a book called Jeremiah. But what about that nation? So Jeremiah records this experience of how he steps over his fears, looking at these obstacles. I guess if you're in the river, every time you see rocks in the river, they're obstacles. But if you're on the bank trying to get from one side to the next, they're no longer obstacles, they're stepping stones. And we have to be able to utilize what could potentially be negative energy in our fear for positive mobilization. Allow your fears to push you forward, not backwards. And so he, he, in verse 5, his experience of being known by God, this divine revelation, now starts to shape him instead of his fears. His experience in the love of God becomes the foundation for the whole of his spiritual life. Oh, how some of us need to hear that today. To understand that God's love needs to shape your spiritual life, not terror. In fact, verse 5 and Jeremiah's experience of God is the foundation for the rest of the whole of the book of Jeremiah. I knew you when you are in your mother's womb, before you were born. I set you apart. God's divine call on his life existed before Jeremiah existed. That appointment in the plan of God to be a prophet predated Jeremiah himself. Incredible. So out of that deep place of knowing the love of God, this person then steps over his fears and he does something remarkable with the rest of his life. There are moments where there is such adverse circumstances around Jeremiah. All he knows to do is to just soak in the presence of God, be aware of the perfect love of God. And whenever he does that, God drives out fear. He didn't have the New Testament, but if he had, he would have read that perfect love casts out fear. But instead, he has this revelation. I knew you. I set you apart. I appointed you. You can take that to the bank when God speaks. So imagine God right now is thinking of you. Here's a good test for you. What do you think God feels when you come into his mind? How do you see God? How do you think he feels about you? Do you think he's disappointed? Do you think he's frustrated with you? Do you think he's angry with you? Do you think he's disgusted with you? Shall I tell you something? That's how you see you. It's not how God sees you. He loves you. He's excited about you and what you can do in collaboration with him. So much of this comes out of life experience. We allow even our theology, even our thoughts towards God to be shaped by the negative experiences of life. What we need to do is allow the revelation of God to shape how we see God, therefore how we see ourselves, therefore how we face our obstacles. It's not the Father's heart to be disgusted, to be dismissive, to be disrespectful, to be frustrated with you. So in verse 5 here, Jeremiah experiences God's heart. He experiences God's love and he gets freed from his fear because of that. The Hebrew word for knowing in the Old Testament, when we know the love of God, it's the same word for experience. Abraham took his wife into the tent and knew her. It doesn't mean they had a coffee and a cake. He 
knew her. It's an intimate knowledge. To know God's revelation is an intimate issue. To know that God loves you, it's an intimate issue. So when God looks at us, when he thinks about us, it's like no other love in the universe. It's the supremest of all loves. No other love can compare with the love God has for you because God loves you with no strings attached. It's not an if love that's dependent on what you do. It's not a because love that is a reward for what you do. God loves you because he is love. And he made you specifically to have a love relationship with him. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. That love is engineered by his character. It's not a reflection on your behavior. And it's out of understanding God's love for me, I am set free to obey him because I love him too. I don't want to sin. I don't want to fall. I don't want to stray because I'm loved and I love him. He's a good, good father and I'm loved by him. That's who I am and that engineers what I do. And he's the only God, only the God of Scripture has a value of cherishing humans before they were born. Babies before they were born have never been more vulnerable to the despicable act of abortion than they are today. As nations all over the world start to cave in to the demands for full-term abortion for all and every reason. But we have a God that according to this revelation in Scripture loved you before you were born. Now if God can love you before you were born, why can we not cherish life before it's born? Just a thought. Let's come to just one final text and wind down today. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. John writes and he says, Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels fear. If we are afraid, it's fear of punishment. And this shows that we've not fully experienced his perfect love. If that fear is controlling you today, it means you've not experienced perfect love because perfect love drives out fear, dissolves, melts it. It's not the power of God that sets you free from fear. It's the love of God. That's incredible. Learning to soak, learning to allow God's love to penetrate our hearts allows you to step over your fear. When you understand that God's love allows you to make mistakes, to stop, to relax, to be restored, to uncover, to recover. So this transformation that Jeremiah has here is for you and me. That love then becomes my identity. Who am I? I am one who is loved by God. Not defined by my ethnicity. Not defined by my academy. I'm not defined by my marriage, my family, or my ancestry. I am who I am by the love of God. So whoever you are today, wherever you are today, God is asking you to step over your fears and be mastered and managed by who God says you are. Nothing less, nothing more, nothing else. God wants you to experience his overwhelming love just like Jeremiah did. And the way to get rid of controlling fear is a personal, direct relationship with the love of God in Christ. God's love coming into you. And that will fill you with courage. It filled my life with courage. It dissolved my fears. They just seeped out of my life as I knew who God said I was. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is making sure that fear does not freeze me. It doesn't incapacitate me. It does not stop my clear thinking. It doesn't stop me saying what I need to say and act. I have stepped over my fears. Why don't you? 
And that's the overall message of Jeremiah, often called the weeping prophet, where he learned to conquer those fears. Fear makes you overestimate the risks and underestimate the benefits. God has incredible blessings for you at the other side of your divine adventures. Don't let fear increase the risk and decrease the reward. Let the opposite happen as you submit to the love of God. Let me end with one final text. And this text is addressed to a young preacher by an aging mentor. The Apostle Paul says this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. But I'm saying it to you today. God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, self-control. When you learn to receive the love of God, you receive power, you receive love, and you retain control. We get out of control when we listen to our fears instead of listening to God. Let me ask you a question today. What would happen if you stepped over your fears? Okay, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's going to be some questions below which are questions for your groups and families today. And may the Lord bless you and your families. May you, your spouses, your children, your parents, your whole house live in the love of God, not the fear of man. In Jesus' name. This is Pastor Anthony checking out. Bye-bye. Now we are going to have a time of offering. Here at ECCI, we believe that offering is an act of worship. So please don't feel obliged to give, but if you would like to, the details will be below on the screen. Thank you. Good morning, church. How are you all doing this morning? We're going to sing a song which says, See a Victory. And we just declare victory right now in your house, in your household, across your family. May you see victory in Jesus' name. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. Oh, I'm not backing down from any giants. Cause I know, I know how this story ends. Yes, I know. Yes, I know how this story ends. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. 
Cause you take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Yes, you take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Let's raise it up so you take You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good You turn it for good Whoa, you take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good I'm gonna see I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle Now that's the end of today's service. We hope and pray that it blessed you and you enjoyed it. Please follow us on our social medias to keep up to date with the church. And we hope and pray we'll see you next week. Bye.